Well, good morning. Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, great to have everyone here. Today we are continuing on. Uh, we had a break on the previous week because we were in lockdown here um, in Queensland, in Australia. So we've missed last week, but this is what would have been uh, last week. So we're on sermon uh, number 10. It's called The Children of Abraham, and we're doing a study on the gospel according to John. So before we get underway, I'll just put up a little chart that we have here, which explains the breakdown of the Gospel of John. And currently we are reading from the Book of Signs. And the Book of Signs is found between chapter 1, verse 19, chapter 12, uh, verse 50. And it's called the Book of Signs because it is full of the miraculous signs that Jesus performs in order to reveal his identity in order that people believe that he is the Son of God. Now in our previous sermon, which was called, Is Jesus the Christ? Jesus travelled alone to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles to teach in the temple courts. The Pharisees and teachers of the law, who challenged him about the miraculous healing of a lame man at the pool of Bethesda, are there again, and they bring a woman to Jesus accused of adultery. So please, let's open our Bibles to the last verse of chapter John, or chapter John, of John <laughs> chapter 7, uh, verse 53. And we're going to read our first portion for today, and we're going to read from John chapter 7, verse 53, through to John 8, verse 11. So I'll just put up that reference on the screen. So John 7, 53 to 8, verse 11. Now, the very first uh, line here, verse, says, Then each went to his own home, and then it continues on, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So it basically connects this chapter to what happened in the previous chapter. And basically they'd reached the end of the day in the temple the previous day, and everyone went to their homes, but of course Jesus wasn't at home, was he? He was in Jerusalem. And so he went to the Mount of Olives, it tells us instead. So reading this portion, verse 53, chapter 7 starts, Then each went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple court. So we get from this that Jesus is sleeping on the rough, basically, all the time. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So you, you probably are familiar with this. Most Christians would be familiar with this story. But when we actually read the story, my question to you, is this passage morally dangerous? So consider what's just happened. A woman has been caught in the act of adultery. It is against one of God's laws, of which he provided a prescribed punishment. The Jews bring her in. To Jesus because they want to use it as a trap for him but at the same time the underbelly of this is is it moral in other words is Jesus turning against the very laws of God 
that were provided to his people? Or is it okay? And if it is okay, why is it okay? What is going on here? What's your thoughts? I think it's a case of uh, interpretation. Interpretation, okay. <laughs> Let's fire away. <laughs> no, no, but the, uh, the laws, you know, it, it wasn't meant for somebody like that. So you've got to interpret as, as each case comes along, like we do in the courts. Okay. So each case as it is, and uh, she, although guilty, she's going to, you know, um, she's going to go her way and be live a life of, um, you know, no sin. No sin. Hmm. So the outcome's righteous. Yeah. But it's not an interpretation of the law. I'm okay. going to disagree. But it's really good thinking because we're obviously trying to evaluate what's going on according to the law, right? So because the outcome of the situation didn't fulfill what the law said was meant to happen, mm. didn't mean it was actually being interpreted. So any other thoughts? I will obviously give you the answer. Well, but he's also saying, walk away, I'm forgiving you. Right. I am so, God. <laughs> So Jesus has a message, obviously, right, <laughs> about Lord. forgiveness, which is well, really important. Yeah. Well, yeah. well my, my view on it is that basically all sin is deserving of death. Right. So basically, um, like he was saying, well, you, if you have never sinned, then yeah, then she's, she definitely deserves death. Right. And the fact is that we've all sinned and fallen short of his glory. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so Jesus is actually speaking, based on what you're saying, he's speaking true justice because yeah. he's not saying that she shouldn't be stoned. He never yeah. said that, yeah. ever. What he is saying, that if anyone else has never sinned, yeah. right? So the issue is, if they, if they haven't sinned, then they're entitled to enforce the law. If they have sinned, because we say that there's no difference between sins, then they too should be punished. Mm. Of course, when they're presented with that, they all walk away because mm. they all know that they have all sinned. Mm. And so Jesus changes the whole paradigm. He changes the way that they're thinking about it because he's got a different angle, of course, and that's that he speaks from the heart. Mm. He's not just trying to practice the legal practices from the mind that they know and learn. Okay, so very good. So the answer to this is that self-righteousness is a sin. So you hear that word, self-righteousness. So these people were self-righteous. They were taking the law into their own hands and they were determining that they were righteous for punishing another woman. Right. So in other words, this wasn't about God. It never was about God. They were bringing this woman as a trap for Jesus. And so in this, they are self-righteous. And as we're saying, it's a sin that all people are guilty of, but the big issue here is often people are oblivious of it. In other words, they say, no, not me. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing what God says. Mm -hmm. right? And so this is the challenge. So the encounter Jesus has with this woman exposes the hypocritical tendency people have as religious leaders or religious people to try and trap people. So in this case, the religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus using a law of Moses from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. It's only a short verse. So I have the whole verse on the screen behind me. The law says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. Both. Where's the man? They didn't yeah. bring any man. Mm. So we've got a problem straight from the get-go, don't we? These self-righteous people only brought the woman. Okay? And so Jesus obviously sees this straight away. He knows the law. And so there's no equality in this law because both have not been brought forward. It'd be interesting, wouldn't it, to think, what would have happened if both the man and the woman was brought forward? The outcome would have been different. And so, and so they call for stoning 
And here's the issue. If Jesus asks for the woman to be released, he will be accused of breaking the law. But if Jesus agrees the woman should be stoned, he will break a Roman law. And the Roman law says that Jews are not permitted to carry out their own executions. This is why the scripture says they're trying to trap him. Because if he agrees to stoning and an execution happens, then he's complicit underneath the Roman law. If he doesn't agree with them, he's complicit under the Jewish law. And so either way, they're out to get him. So this is why the scripture says they're trying to trap him. So there's two laws at play here. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law care nothing for true justice, clearly because it's a trap. And why do I say that? And it's because they only bring the man, sorry, the woman, and not the man. Okay? If it was true justice, both parties would be there. So instead of stepping into a legal snare, Jesus bends down and traces his finger in the sand whilst they question him. So here's, a, here's some advice for us all. If you're about to mouth off because you've been accused of something, bend down and trace your finger in the sand until you count to ten. <laughs> Right? So they're talking, but Jesus is no doubt there thinking very carefully about how he's going to reply to them. Okay, So don't just respond off the cuff. Mm. Take a moment and think and breathe. And then he says, he does not, and this is the key, he actually doesn't deny the legal penalty for adultery or stoning, so that's why it's not interpretation. He never says, no, that's not right. But rather he says, if any one of you is without sin... Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So his response is flawless. Why? Because it both preserves a Roman law at the time and it preserves a Jewish law. Okay. So it relieves him from their trap and at the same time it calls out the evil heart of the accusers. Okay. Because they have an intention. So when Jesus resumes writing on the ground, the accusers walk away one by one until Jesus is left alone with a woman. Interesting, isn't it? So he doesn't get up and say, you nasty so-and-sos. He just goes back to tracing. In other words, he allows people's own conscience Mm -hmm. to make a decision for themselves and walk away. He doesn't say, get out of here, go away, you're all evil. He just goes back to tracing. Because those words that he said, he doesn't need to do anything further. So unlike her accusers, Jesus cares for her most pressing need, and this is what he's looking at. He doesn't condemn her, but extends grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And so this is the second part of what Roger was saying. He reassures her with words of grace because he says, then neither do I condemn you. And words of truth, go now and leave your life of sin. So this passage isn't morally dangerous because she has paid a price with her own guilt and shame. So Jesus offers her a new life. So when he says in that short verse, go now, what he's saying is, you are forgiven. All right? So unlike today where we have these big florid sort of descriptions and explanations, if you read most of what Jesus says, it's just really quite direct. Go now means you're forgiven. And when he says, leave your life of sin, He's telling her that she must choose a holy and sinless life. She must change, in other words. The story illustrates the harmony between justice and mercy in Christ's salvation. God pronounces judgment on sin, yes, but he also provides a way to escape condemnation. Isn't that the whole point? This is why Jesus is there in the first place. So scripture from Romans chapter 3 Verses 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And so there is the answer to this conundrum. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. And the justification, that was the legalistic aspect of it, justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So it's telling us there's only one way. And Jesus was the one there, and he gave her grace, and he gave her redemption, and told her to change her ways. 
So you see, Jesus doesn't encourage sin, but he loves the sinner. That's the difference, right? Most people point out the sinner and there's no love going on there. He silences critics whilst healing hearts. Sin isn't treated in a casual manner, but a sinner is called to turn away from what corrupts their life. In John 7, in the previous chapter, everything that occurs during the Feast of Tabernacles is designed to remind the Jews of the time their forefathers spent in the wilderness. I mentioned in the previous sermon how the Jews lived in booths throughout the feast to remind themselves of how their ancestors lived in the wilderness. But I didn't mention that every day during the feast, a pitcher of water from the pool of Siloam is poured over the altar in the temple. And this leads us into the next scripture that we're about to read. This was to remind them how God poured out water for them from the rock. So in other words, they would pour the water over the stone and that would be an example or a reminder of what the Lord gave them in the past. So it is with this in mind that Jesus points to himself in John 7, verses 37 to 39, when he says, If anyone is thirsty, so this is the previous chapter, let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me. As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit. I find it really interesting. Many people say that when they read the Bible or they teach, that they're going to reveal the hidden secrets to you. Does anyone need any revealing to this hidden secret here? Do you ever notice this? Yeah. It's said a lot. Yeah. But the whole point of why God gave you his word is so that you can know. So anyone who says there's all these secret meanings in the Bible and they're all hidden and you know numbers this and all the rest of it, it's complicated, right? For me, when I read that, I think it's really obvious what Jesus means personally. And so this is the point. You know, we, don't, we lack context today because it was written in a time a long time ago. And we don't know what it's like to live then. We're not necessarily au fait with all of the laws, etc. So we can get it wrong because of context. However, the written word isn't confusing. And it's not secretive. It's actually there to reveal to us. So today, we come to another of these symbols when we read the opening words from John Chapter 8, verse 12. So continuing on with today's scripture. So John 8, verse 12. And it reads, When Jesus spoke again to the world, to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Right? Again. Simple. Right? It's simple. Right? And it has a spiritual meaning. But context says that he's talking to whom? He's talking to Jews. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to priests. And so he has a double-edged sword in this somewhere because it has to be something that strikes a chord with them. And so my question to you now, before I explain further, is what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the light of the world? What do you think he means? He's overcome our sin. He is the light which destroys the darkness and we walk in that light. Right. And so we hear the talk of light and darkness in the scriptures. And we, and right. Darkness and, is evil. Correct. And so darkness is evil. We talk about, uh, well, the scriptures we'll talk about in a moment, how people walk in darkness. Okay. So let's define that. What is darkness? We have talked about this before. Absolutely. The absence of God. So light is the presence of God. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, here he is there in front of these people present and he's there to shine a light into the darkness that abides. Okay. So when we read this commandment to follow, so walk with and obey Jesus, we need to bring context to the time in which it is written. And it actually reflects on a ceremony that took place every evening in the temple courts with two giant candelabras 
which are known as, everyone know what they call? Menorahs. And they were lit to illuminate the courts at night time. And so I have a picture here from the Arch of Titus in Rome. When the Romans destroyed the second temple, they carried the menorah, the candelabra, off to Rome. Okay, so this is in an arch, there's a road passing under, it's really grubby nowadays, it's a real shame the condition it's in. Uh, but this is the menorah. The key to, the, to look at here though, is if you actually look at the size of the men carrying it, you can actually gauge the size of the menorah itself. Mm. You can also see the detail that's actually on that would allow a Jewish person today to very easily replicate exactly what the menorah was built like. Okay? And so this, as it says here, the menorah was paraded through the streets of Rome in AD 71. Today, if you go to the old city of Jerusalem, they have rebuilt in anticipation of the temple, which they believe will be rebuilt. They have actually reproduced the menorah. So this is to size. So if you actually look at the people down here, you can see it's actually a very, very large object. And so what they would do is on the temple courts at night, they would bring one of these or two of these out and they would light all of these. Okay. Now for Hanukkah, which is a different thing, which we're not going to go into today, they actually have a candelabra that looks exactly the same as that thing. It has nine candle heads, whereas this one has seven candle heads. Okay, so this one is a menorah, uh, and it's a replica from the time of the Romans. So um, the temple, this is built by the Temple Institute. Uh, another story, I guess, for another day. The Temple Institute is an organization in uh, Jerusalem today who are preparing to rebuild the temple. So what they're doing is all of the implements of the of the temple, like the menorah, they're actually prefabricating them ready for the day that the temple is rebuilt again. The interesting thing is I had a uh, communication with them during the week, and one of the things that they actually said is that they're doing stuff in order to, uh, what was their words? Uh, I can't remember the exact word, but basically it means to make it happen. No? Now we have, we have people, Christians, walking around today, some of which we know, who say we're participating in this because we're bringing it on. Right? So in other words, if we contribute to this today, then the time that the Lord returns will happen faster, right? Because we get to do that, right? The Bible tells us it'll happen at a time that we do not know. And yet people are doing things today because they want to bring it forward. And so they think if they get everything ready, it will happen faster. The, fine, the thing that I find extraordinary about this is what happened to King David when he did exactly this. The Lord said to him, no, mate, not you. Your son's going to build it. He stopped him. This is the message for the Hebrew people, for the Israelites, for the Jews of today. Right? It's all there in the scriptures. And yet you've got people who are actively getting contributions of money in order to make things, in order to bring the Lord forward, so to speak. Bring the temple forward. So it's quite extraordinary. But this is going on. So here it is. It's in, it's in the Jewish quarter uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. Here's the menorah. It's in a big uh, perspex bubble, um, obviously protected with security. Um, it's not exactly the same as the original one because it's actually only coated in gold whereas the original one was fully made out of gold. Okay, But this is what they were lighting in the temple courts. Okay, So these Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were in the temple courts would know that every day the light is lit in order to cancel out the darkness. And so Jesus is saying, I am that light in a spiritual sense that will cancel out the darkness. So it is in this reference to this that Jesus declares, I am the light of the world, not just a light to illuminate the temple, nor just a light for the Jewish people, but a light for all people from all, for all nations of the world. These are words to be taken seriously. Jesus isn't saying, I am the light of the world for he who knows about me. 
Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world for he who follows me, for he who walks with me, for he who obeys me, and for he who stays with me. In other words, people say, oh yeah, I believe in God. Okay. Doesn't mean anything. Not going to go to heaven for that, are they? So Jesus is basically saying that faith is a action. And so what he's commanding here is he says, I'm the light of the world, but in order for you to follow him, he gives you commandments of what you have to do. And so there's a strong message in this. So people are walking in darkness, so much so that Jesus declares in a scripture we haven't come to yet, but I'll just read it. It's a brief one from John 12, verse 35. He says, The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. And this leads into the ongoing scriptures with Jesus, because he keeps saying to these Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. Mm -hmm. And he says that because they are sinners who don't repent and don't believe in the Lord. So he says, you can't come. So for all the other religions today, you can't come. I saw, I saw a very interesting uh, analogy the other day. A person was asked, they had to, about to get in the car and they had all their keys. And he says, I have keys and they open all sorts of locks. Think of all the keys like opening different locks to different mm. religions. He says, but there's only one key that opens the door of this car. Mm -hmm. Think of that key as Jesus who opens the gates to heaven. Mm. They're all keys. They all open cars. But only one opens this car and so this is the same message here jesus says that i am the light and those who follow me will have eternal life but he's saying this to the jews because they are walking in darkness and so a strong message so if you ask yourself and this is something we should all ask ourselves do i know where i am going sincerely do i know where i'm going and the answer is yes, then you are walking in the light. If you answer no, then you are walking in darkness. That means you cannot see what's coming. So there are two things that keep people from walking in the light. What do you think they are? Two things that keep people from walking in the light. They haven't got a relationship with Jesus. Right. And why... Wouldn't they have a relationship with Jesus? What things can cause someone not to have a relationship? Right? So for people who maybe believe or say they believe in Jesus, they may have a Bible, that sort of thing. What about people who've never heard of Jesus? Right? So one of the things God commands us, Jesus commands us, is to go out and to share the gospel. Right? Because he doesn't want to leave anyone behind. And so that's one of his commands when he left, when, he, when the ascension happened. So there's two things. One is ignorance, and there's different types of ignorance, and the other one is pride. I'm in control. I don't need any Lord. When I die, I'm going to stay in the dirt. <laughs> Pretty stupid, right? But pride. So let's read the next portion of Scripture from John 8, again, verses 13 to 20. So John 8, verses 13 to 20. It reads, The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. So Jesus is talking about your identity, their identity at this point in time. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. He just released the woman who they wanted to stone for adultery. He says here, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. Why? Because he is there to save the sinners. He's in the flesh at the moment. Right? It's not judgment day. No. So he has a purpose in being there. 
So reading on in verse 16, but if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So he's just categorically told these Jews to the face that he is the Son of God. So they're not happy. Then they asked him, where is your father? And this is Jesus' point, isn't it? He's like, you don't know who he is? Seriously? Verse, carrying on. You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So he's talking about this, about knowing the father. So what's one of the ways, we're going to come back to it a little bit more. What's one of the ways that you can know the Father through Jesus? Getting saved. Getting saved? What's the book of John pressing us with? I was going to say your Bible. The Bible? Faith. What is Jesus doing as he's walking around the land? He Miracles. Performing signs. miraculous signs. signs. Some of them are healings. We call them miracles, but they're miraculous signs. In other words, he's doing something that no man of the flesh can do. They all know this. These are the same people who are persecuting him after he got the lame man at the pool of Bethesda and says, stand up, walk, take your mat with you. And so here he is talking to them about exactly the same thing in that sense. So in verse 14, Jesus says, I know where I come from, but you have no idea. That is ignorance remember we spoke about there is ignorance and there is pride right i know where i come from but you have no idea in verse 19 jesus says you do not know me or my father that is what's that you do not know me or my father ignorance ignorance again they're both examples of ignorance so he's basically saying to these guys in front of him you're ignorant And this is the same ignorance that continues to hold millions upon millions of people in darkness to this day. So my question to you, there's two types of ignorance. What do you think they are? Two types of ignorance. We're talking about the Lord here. Ignoring the truth. Sorry? Ignoring the truth. Ignoring the truth. Yeah. And ignoring... Commandments. Ignoring the commandments. Lack of, lack of knowledge. Lack of Being, knowledge. Having an open mind to receive. Right. To receive and having, as opposed to you've got yeah. a closed mind, makes you ignorant. What does Jesus command, I've just mentioned it earlier, what does Jesus command you to do? Spread the gospel. Come to on. share the gospel, to go out and to share the gospel. Mm. How is someone going to hear about Jesus unless somebody speaks about Jesus? Okay, so the first one is that there's those who have never heard of Jesus categorically, right? The second one is those who have heard of him but still don't know who he is. Big worry, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one of the concerns in the church today. It is imperative that people know the true Jesus and is incumbent upon the church, which we're talking about the believers who follow Jesus, to teach and share the gospel to the ignorant so they too might know. John's account highlights the ignorance of the religious leaders in the presence of Jesus. They reject him just as people issue, uh, just sorry, big pardon. They reject him just as people do today. But Jesus says in verse 14, even if I testify my behalf, so this is the ignorance thing, right? He's saying, even if I tell you my testimony is valid. So in other words, the issue is judgment. Right? They're ignorant, but they're still judging who Jesus is. So one of the issues that we have to consider is that we shouldn't judge. Why? Because Jesus is basically telling us to, but more so, he's telling us not to because usually we have no idea. People judge off the cuff without knowing all the facts all the time, right? And then you find yourself backpedaling, trying to explain to them and justifying yourself to them. Why? Just because they accused you. But why do they accuse you? They're ignorant. They don't know. 
So what the Lord's telling us is that if you're secure in your identity in Christ, then you shouldn't need to explain yourself. Mm. And he's saying here that himself, that even when I testify, it's pointless because you don't believe me anyway. Mm -hmm. So in other words, don't explain your faith to someone, not in the sense of persecution. Don't get in an argument. It's a waste of time. Right? You just share. If people want to know, you be that person that teaches them and helps them and guides them and provides them what they need. Right? We give testimonies for people who want to hear, whose hearts are open and their minds are open. We give them an example of what it was like for us to make it more believable for them, right? But if you want to give your testimony to someone who's completely and utterly closed and opposed to you, do you think it's going to change them? It's not, is it? And so this is the same thing that Jesus is doing. What's his testimony? Well, he's cruising around Israel performing miracles. I mean, you know, if you say, oh, I don't believe you, you know, there'd be a whole stack of people who would get up and say, well, Jesus raised me from the dead. You know, I couldn't walk since birth. He, now I can walk normal, etc., etc., etc. Okay? So there's plenty of testimonies. So this is why Jesus says, "If I test, uh, even if I testify on my behalf. So the issue is judgment. You can seek more evidence to validate a claim, but you can't reject a claim because you are ignorant of the answer. So in other words, the people who are persecuting Jesus are ignorant right so you can't judge if you're ignorant you don't have the right to judge why does a court of law work the way it is you have to bring evidence in order to be judged right but they're willing they just don't want a bar of him so jesus continues to say in verse 14 i know where i came from and where i am going and there is a remarkable life principle for us to recognize in this and it's what we call our identity so, people who are secure in their identity and where they come from are confident and able to stand up against the accusations of others. So, in other words, someone says, oh, you come from there. It's like, no, I don't. I come from there. What was one of the situations with Jesus? You're a... Nazarene. Right? And the prophecy says... You're meant to be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And he's basically saying, well, if you did your homework, you realise that I was actually born in Bethlehem, but I come from Nazareth. Right? Ignorance. And so they're judging that he can't be the Messiah based on the wrong facts. Ignorance. The second component, but people who are not secure in their identity and not sure where they came from are usually inconsistent, uncertain and unreliable. True? Simple truth, right? So identity is very important. And this is why Jesus says to us that we are to identify in him. We are to become more Christ-like. It makes us more secure. It gives us peace. Right? One of the biggest fears of life is death itself, right? Because it's an unknown. We don't know what happens. Nobody wants to think that they're going to be tossed into a box in the ground. And that's it. Right? So the peace that we have is the belief that even though our body will decay, that our soul continues to live on and there is an eternal life. But imagine thinking that you get thrown into a box and your body decays and your soul does rise from your body and then it goes to hell. Now that would be a real shame. And so this is what faith is about like the scripture says because it gives us hope for things that are yet unseen okay hebrews 11 1. so as christians you should be certain of your identity so this is a statement you should be certain of your identity if you're not then you have some work to do you must truly believe god has freed you from your old life of sin and made you a new creation in Christ. This means you believe what God says about you and you refuse to listen to the enemy, which is anybody who opposes that belief. Anybody who opposes that belief. This is why Jesus is confident and says to them, I know where I came from and where I am going. 
In John 5, verse 46, it's not a scripture I'm putting up on the screen, it's only short. Jesus said to these men, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So this is something we've already covered. In other words, they have ample evidence. So what does this tell us? These men are either ignorant or suffer from pride. Either way, they don't believe the scriptures by which they judge Jesus. Whether people identify as children of Abraham or followers of Jesus today, if you don't believe the word of God, then you can't know who Jesus is. This is where the interesting part about Isaiah 53 being missing from the Hebrew text, right? because of the identification that it provides for Jesus. Jesus tells these men in verse 15, you judge by human standards. This is like saying, you reject my claims and regard me as a troublemaker with no political influence, no wealth and no social standing. You think I came from Nazareth. This is something that they've already contested. And you say, I am not the Messiah. But if you investigate and realize I was born in Bethlehem, you might think differently of me. You think if I am the Messiah, I'm supposed to lead a revolt against Rome. Right? Because they see them as an earthly king of the Jews. A king will lead his nation to fight an enemy, right? And so because he doesn't stand up against the Romans and form an army, they're saying you can't be the Messiah. But that's not what the scripture said. And yet this is what they use as a means for judging him. And because of that, they reject him. And you can also say you never read the scriptures that reveal who I am, which is what I've just mentioned. So this is an issue. So take notice of this. You never read the scriptures that say certain things. This is part of the problem that we have today. We have a modern church in which a gay person can be a priest. What they call the progressive movement, right? The scriptures give us direct laws, commandments, instructions from God that tells us that this is not okay. And so what does that person who stands in that role and leads those people think they are doing? They are choosing which bits they want. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for their parish or their congregation? They've now led the whole congregation astray. Mm. Anybody, anybody that goes into that church under that person is astray. Mm. They use this little soft thing by saying, Oh, yes, but as Christians, we're meant to forgive, right? We're meant to accept all people. No. Mm -hmm. You don't accept a teacher of the word that doesn't walk with God. Mm. It's all skew whiff, isn't it? It's all warped. And this is what we've got going on in many churches. This is a, a big, big problem for today. So Jesus, oh, sorry. In verses 16 to 18, Jesus points out, If I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. A person is free to give testimony about themselves, but if corroborated by another, all the better. So when Jesus claims God is his witness, he calls him what? Father. Okay. This is foreign to the Jews. Because there's many names for God, but not Father. So he calls him Father. So I'm going to ask you now. I want you to name three ways God has provided testimony to who Jesus is in the Gospel of John. So we're on our 10th sermon. We've been teaching our way through all of this. Name, or well, you can name one. But there's three ways God has provided testimony to who Jesus is. In the Gospel of John. Who'd like to provide one? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So his testimony was he came to be the person to prepare ye the way for the Lord. Oh. Right? Very good. It's actually outside of the three that I'm going to talk about. So there's a fourth one. <laughs> we can rewrite this. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> what else? I just mentioned. Signs. The signs, the miraculous signs. Perfect. Okay. So the first testimony is the miraculous signs. John 3, 2 says, No one 
No one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with them. Okay? Mm. Testimony. A second one comes from being convicted by God that the words of Jesus agree with how they feel and what they experience. Isn't that how we come to know the Lord? We read the scriptures and you say, that's me. I really need to do something about it. Mm. Isn't that how we start getting led to the Lord? We become convicted by the word of God and we need to change our ways. If we are living in sin, isn't it the laws of God that actually tells us what sins are in order that we can actually change away from them? Mm. How do you know it's a sin if it's not defined? Okay. So John seven forty six says, No one ever spoke the way this man does. Notice the categorical no ones. No one ever spoke the way this man does. And the third testimony of God comes from the fulfillment of Scripture because Jesus repetitively fulfills the word given by God through his actions, his words, and his circumstances. Right? We keep getting references to Scripture from the Old Testament in relation to Jesus. They are signs that point forward so people can identify who Jesus is. And of course we have a full fun. <laughs> so that's wonderful. So despite the constant witness pointing to his divine identity, the religious leaders reject Jesus because they are ignorant of the facts. So ignorant that in verse 19 they ask, where is your father? So let's read now from John 8. Verses 21 to 30, the next portion. John 8, verses 21 to 30. It reads, Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, Will he kill himself? We're going to address that, because it's a pretty strange answer, right? He says, you're going to go where he cannot come. They say, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. So they're still clueless. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy and what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up or exalted the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed him. So in other words, the scriptures just said that no one else speaks like him and that people are convicted when he speaks. So this is happening even as he's being contested. The interesting thing is here, and we're going to come to it in just a moment, is just have a think while I'm talking about what Jesus meant when he said, when you, he's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, right? He says in verse 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. What do you think he's talking about? He's speaking to the people who are persecuting him. He says, when you have lifted up. Any ideas? The priests and the... Think on it. I'll come back to it. I will give you an answer in a moment. The religious leaders can't see who is before their eyes. This is an issue for many today. God is real and living, not a figment of the imagination. There are many different denominations and doctrines. Christians, as I mentioned earlier, have become divided into traditional and progressive movements. Christians decide which laws of God they accept and which ones they don't. Christians no longer worship God in all, but use man-made effects to create so-called spiritual encounters. Christians proclaim God in word, but not in deed. Christians don't read their Bibles, and many openly declare they don't agree with what it is said. 
If you ask how this can be, it is because Christians don't believe that God will punish their sin for eternity. If you become an ordained priest, a pastor of God, and you don't abide by his laws, how on earth does that person think that they're going to be with the Lord for eternity? What we're speaking about in all those statements are hypocrisy. People who use the name a Christian like a brand label. I'm a Christian, therefore I am? What? This is the problem nowadays. It's not readily identifiable, is it? Because there's so many different doctrines, so many denominations, so many different practices, things that don't align with the Word of God, and yet they all call themselves Christians. Right? So this is a huge problem today. The only way that you could walk in life and think like that is to think that God is not actually going to punish you. Right? If you actually lived in awe of God and you believed there is a day of judgment coming if you don't do what he says, then why on earth would you do something in this life? You have to realize that it's not going to wash when it gets to the other end. So they must, people who do this must not believe that there is actually a real judgment or punishment for the sin coming. So I don't know what Bible they're reading because mine says that there's a judgment coming for those who sin. And we're talking about something here. If we've done something wrong, we're all very clear about this. If we have done something wrong, then we repent for our sins. But the Lord commands us to change, does he not? We just read the story about the woman who came to him as an adulteress. Right? He told her to go and sin no more. So he doesn't say, go, you're forgiven, and just carry on like you were before. He says, and sin no more. In other words, you have to change. And so this is part of the problem. He's confronting these Pharisees, thinking about this in context, and they're basically wanting to practice the law, but he's saying you have to actually change. Because if you don't, you don't know where I'm going because I'm not going to see you there because you're going to hell. He's making it abundantly clear to them that this is the consequences of the actions here on earth. So the problem that we have, and we talk about this often, is that people believe God is who they want him to be, not who he is. People today, if you ask them a question, try it sometime, who do you think God is? They won't, ask, they won't code who he is from the Bible. They'll say, for me, he is, and they'll start describing their bubble. There may be elements of biblical truth in there, but there's probably elements of there which is from their earthly world, the parts that they don't want to believe in. So you may choose to be offended what I say today, but take it as a warning. It's not my opinion. It's what the Lord says. The same warning was given by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church some 2,000 years ago. Paganism is all around you, and I'm not talking about those outside of the church either. But those within. Who's Jesus talking to right now? He's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the laws, those who are within. Nothing has changed. It's still going on today. Jesus says to the Jews in verse 22, Where I go, you cannot come, and so it will be for many Christians today. Don't be one of their number. Listen to his parable that he gave on the goat and the sheep. You don't want to get to the gate. And he says, Verily, I don't know you. And they go, Oh, yeah, yeah, but I did this in your name. I did that. He says, No, sorry, don't know you. Okay, you don't want to be one of those number. So this is real this is real message. This is not the stuff that wants to make you feel good. What will make you feel good is doing what the Lord commands. And then you have nothing to worry about. And this is why the word of God gives you peace. Because you can actually know. But you have a free will and you make a choice for yourself. And that's the truth of it. Willful ignorance blinds hearts. Again, willful ignorance blinds hearts. In other words, you've got a free will, it's your choice. 
The second reason people remain in darkness <coughs> is pride. The Jews challenging Jesus miss the point. When people die in their sin, as he's communicating, it means they are separated from God and go to hell. Pretty strong words that Jesus is giving. Dying in their sin. Do we die in our sin if we are going to heaven? No. No, no it's our bodies that die and decay here on earth. Right? There's a difference between the two. When people die in their sin, it means they are separated from God and go to hell. And Jesus will not be there. So when they respond and say in verse 22, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? You have to understand these words are words of a sarcastic, self-righteous and prideful people. Pharisees believe people who commit suicide go to the deepest part of hell. So their question is rhetorical in character. They certainly won't be killing themselves to go with Jesus. Remember he says, said about dying to sin. They reject what Jesus says because of pride. They consider themselves good and decent people whom God would never send to hell or shut out from heaven. But listen how Jesus responds to them in verses 23 to 24. He goes on to say, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. In other words, there's only one way. If they don't believe he is who he is, then they are going to die in their sin. Right? So Jesus makes a clear statement of his divinity and what will happen to them if they do not believe in him. They have no idea what is going on in the invisible realm. And this is one of the issues and for us today too. They do not see God's plan. In fact, they don't see anything beyond what their eyes see or hear with their ears. They are blind and their ignorance and pride actually separates them from God. They are so clueless, they ask Jesus in verse 25, Who are you? After everything that's happened. But verse 27 reveals they did not understand. So Jesus says in verses 28 to 29, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know who I am. So in other words, after everything that's happened, later they will lift Jesus up, which means they're going to nail him to a cross to die for their sins. Remember what he said? That they're going to die in their sins. But they're going to raise him up on a cross and he's going to die for their sins. And that's why he says, when you lift me up, then you're going to know who I am. Why? Because when they put him down, he's going to get back up again three days later. Right? So as Jesus spoke, verse 30 reveals that many put their faith in him, apart from the ignorant and the prideful again. So in the next portion of scripture titled, The Children of Abraham and the Children of the Devil, it's from John 8, verses 31 to 47. We're going to learn that many Jews still refuse to believe. So John 8, verses 31 to 47. And it reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. All right? Good advice. If you hold to my teaching, it makes you a disciple. So what do you should you be doing? Reading your Bible, something I say constantly. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, "We here comes the pride. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free?" Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son, a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. 
I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. Now you have to understand there's three religions who claim Abraham to be the father right now. Jews, Muslims and Christians. Why do you think the Muslims have to get through to Abraham via Ishmael, via the other path? It's their way of giving them credit, credibility through bloodline descendancy, which is a broken chain of 17 miss, missing descendants, hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet they claim this. A claim that was only made a couple of hundred years ago, but is now accepted as fact amongst them. The problem is, Jesus is saying, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter whose blood you've got coursing through your veins. Mm -hmm. That is not what makes you a son. What makes you a son is believing in him. So Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? He must be pretty frustrated with this <laughs> guy. By now, too. Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of a sin? Mm. Right? So he's hitting them back in a legalistic way. If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Wow. Mm. He was going to make some good friends there, wasn't he? So my question to you is, many people do not understand what freedom is. How do you define freedom? What do you define freedom as? Believing in Jesus and God. Right? <laughs> Any other? <laughs> That's the answer that we want to hear. What do people normally define freedom as? Not enslaved. Free will. Not enslaved. Free will. Free will. Yeah. Knowing who you are. Knowing your identity in Christ. Right. Free to travel the world without restrictions. So the problem with free will is in that free will is people who believe that freedom gives them the ability to do whatever they like, mm. right? which is not walking with God. Mm. Right? Opposite. So freedom is defined as being able to be all you are called to be. Did you hear that? Freedom is defined as being able to be all you are called to be. Who calls you? The Lord. Right. Not the devil. What? Who you are called to be gives you freedom. Okay. Whereas many people believe freedom is being able to do whatever they like. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, who believed him, sorry, in verse 31 to 32, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Therefore, according to Jesus, there are four steps to freedom. Okay. The first one. Discipleship begins with belief. Okay. You can't disciple someone if they don't believe what you're saying. <laughs> The second one is to continue in his word. The third one is that you can know the truth. And I'll come back to the, the, the long uh, uh, explanation in a moment. And the fourth one is that when you believe in him, continue in his word and know the truth. In other words, the first three, mm. then the truth will set you free. Yeah. So you can't have truth setting you free if you don't no. actually believe in the first place. Right? So... So let's just uh, roll through those quickly. Discipleship begins with belief. 
Examine the evidence for yourself. That says Jesus is who he claims to be. Many people reject Jesus without examining who he is. Right? People say, oh no, I don't believe that. But they don't, they've never read the Bible, right? Second one, continue in his word. Read the word, study the word, meditate on the word, ponder the word. Listen to Jesus and compare what he says against your own life experience and consider if what he says explains what is going on. And so that's really how we most of us come to the Lord, right? We've got things going on in our life. We're not happy. We know it's not right. And so we read or we hear or we preach to and we go, oh, yeah, that's me. Right? And Jesus offers you a way out. Okay, unlike anyone else. And so this is continuing in the word. Hold to his teaching because it is a process. In other words, we do this our whole lives like we are today. There are two types of people who confess their belief. There's those who outwardly conform and become followers. I liken to this people who are in the car but asleep. Right? They're in the car but they're asleep. And there's those who accept Jesus into their hearts and become disciples. And they're the ones who are in the car and behind the wheel. They're driving the car. Right? Disciples. So the third one, you can know the truth. You'll be able to discern for yourself and see through all the lies that surround you in this world and try to draw you away from Jesus. So all the questions of doubts and ifs and, you know, does the Bible say this and, you know, there's this sort of uh, hidden meaning and, you know, there's actually a flat earth and there's aliens and but I still believe in God and all that rubbish, right? All the conspiracy theories that are flying around today, everyone predicting when end times is going to happen when Jesus says you won't know, all that stuff is leading you away from Jesus. Okay. That's simple. Jesus actually tells you what to do. He gives you commands. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to work it out for yourself. Just do what he says. And so fourthly, as we mentioned, when you believe in him, continue in his word and know the truth, the truth will set you free. So what does Jesus set you free from? The naughty one. The, the naughty one. Darkness. Yep. And what are those things like? How do they pan out in real life? What What are those things Money. that Jesus is giving you freedom material, from? Material things. Material things? What else? Fear. 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 Very good. What else? He sets you free from bondage. From bondage? Mm. There's a whole range of things that we experience or feel in life where we're not really free. Mm. How many times a day does someone go, hey, how are you going? Oh, yeah, I'm great, thanks. Lockdown. And you're all lying. You've really got problems, but yeah. you, you don't want anyone to know, right? So you put on the, the facade. You don't want people to think, oh, you're a down person, or every time you speak to them, they've got a problem or something negative. So you're lying, right? Yeah. So in other words, you're not free. True? So fear, worry, anxiety, insecurity, timidity, anger, guilt, shame, and pride are just a few of them. Right? This is what it sets us free from. It sets us free from all the things that affect our heart. Right? Money is not an issue on its own. It's the fear of not having any money that bothers us. Right? Getting a job is not a problem. It's being anxious about getting a job that's the problem. Pride's not a problem, is it? Right? But pride is, when you, is a problem when you don't want to listen. You don't want to be told when you want to place yourself above someone else, right? The truth will set you free. So John goes on to introduce the single biggest issue that hinders the Jews from freedom when they answer Jesus in verse 33, saying, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Their problem is their self-sufficiency. Again, it's about self. They declare as children of Abraham, they have never been in bondage to anyone. Is that true? No. Okay. <laughs> so you examine their history, both in the Bible and extra biblically. You may think that this claim is ridiculous, especially as they're currently, in the context of the scripture we're reading, they're currently under the rule of the Romans, right? But if you read the verse that way, you're actually missing the point. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. They know that their nation is in bondage, but this is not what they mean. They claim they are free and acceptable to God because they are the children of Abraham. They're talking about their identity in the Lord. So they're saying through Abraham, through their bloodline descendancy, no matter what they've done wrong, they'll always be acceptable before God. But Jesus is saying, not anymore. He's saying, only through me. So we have a huge change in everything. The, 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 the very fabric, the very core has been pushed sideways and they've been told, no, it's not like that anymore. But isn't this the very reason that Jesus came? Yeah. That's the whole point, isn't it? But they don't want to listen to him. So they boast they are part of a chosen race and assume because of this, they automatically have God's approval no matter how they behave. God still gave them laws, remember? <laughs> so Jesus cuts right through this and says in John 8, 34, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. If you follow wrong and do wrong, you'll become a slave to wrong and it will control you. But Jesus gives them a way out in verse 35 to 36 when he says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And of course he's talking about himself, the son of God. And he declares himself to be the son of man. He comes as our high priest. So Jesus points out that slavery is opposite to freedom. The men say they are free, but Jesus says they don't know how much of a slave they have become. There are things that don't seem to be too big a deal at first. So this is the same for us, right? Sometimes it's just a little thing. We can still see the, the prize. We've just moved one step away. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's okay. You know, it's not a biggie. And then we take another step away. And those little micro steps, before we know it, we're a long way away from the source already. Right? So this is what Jesus is saying to them. You know, the compound effect of what's happened moves them away from God altogether, regardless of their bloodline. And this, though, is how people justify their behavior, right? We can do that too. Oh, yeah, but it's only a little bit different to that. But what happens if we're already 10 steps away from where we should be? It's not a little bit different from that. It's now hugely different. Yeah, but it is. Right. And so this is how our walk with God is, where it says we continue in the word, right? Because as we correct ourselves and improve ourselves, we take all of those micro steps back towards Jesus. And our identity starts to look more like Jesus rather than looking like the devil. This is what we all have to do. So Jesus tells her, and he tells this woman who committed adultery to go, you're free to go, I've forgiven you, but you have to walk away from sin. So this is his message. Things can be popular, fun, and cause people to believe they are free, but when they can't stop, they learn sin has enslaved them. It's like asking someone if they're an alcoholic. Oh no, I only have a bottle of wine with dinner every night. Okay, so could you actually not have that bottle of wine with dinner? Oh no, it's okay, it's, I'm, I'm, it's not drinking. I drink once a week. You understand what I'm saying? So if you have something and you're not drunk, there's nothing wrong with it. Right? But if you can't stop it, then you've got a problem, right? You have an addiction. And that's what we're talking about here. So this is what happened to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So Jesus strips their facade away and makes it clear, just because they are the children of Abraham, they are not sons but slaves who will eventually be cast out. And if you ask why, if they are bloodline descendants, they are not sons, it is because to become a son, you have to believe in Jesus. Forgive my terminology. Son, obviously we, we're, not, we're not talking about gender here, so with the Bible. The Bible often says man, men, and son. But we're talking about sons and daughters in Christ. In John 8, verses 37 to 38, Jesus says, I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Again, Jesus acknowledges their bloodline, but he questions who is their father that they actually proclaim. 
They say it is Abraham, but Jesus says, if you are Abraham's children, you should talk like him and act like him. It's fair, isn't it? Mm. But because they want to kill Jesus, he declares this reveals the father they have is a murderer. These men don't like nor accept this because they are Jews and declare they are not illegitimate children, but children of God. How ironic. When Jesus is born of the Father by the Holy Spirit, they find this hard to believe, but as bloodline descendants of Abraham, who God chose to set apart from other people, they claim legitimacy. Was Abraham not a sinner? Was Abraham not called out from people who worshipped the moon god uh, Sin or Nana, as it was called, in ancient Ur? Did, 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 did their life journeys occur without sin? Did not Abraham try to get rid of his wife twice, <laughs> unsuccessfully? And yet he was given a covenant by God that he would have a child through her from which the people would descend all the way through to Jesus? I mean, it's just hypocrisy, isn't it? It's just nonsense. So Jesus is both a Jew and divine. And as such, they have no cause to seek his, his death. In fact, he says to them in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now I am here. Their proud claims are worthless, but their hearts are filled with pride, hatred and murder. And so Jesus says, they must come from another father. So let's bring context to what is happening. We're almost, almost there. So Jesus is talking with the Jews in the temple court. So this is context. People are listening and hanging on every word. Some believe and some do not. And the Pharisees with the teachers of the law are upset and feel threatened. It is in this setting that Jesus asks three questions. Verse 33. Why is my language not clear to you? They have no answer. So Jesus answers for them and says, because you're unable to hear what I say. He then tells them why in verses 44 to 45, saying, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. So Jesus finally strips away the veil and opens the door to the invisible kingdom. See, he's talking to them no matter what's going on there in the physical realm. He's actually talking about his father in heaven all the time. They're claiming their life descendancy based on the fact that Abraham... A physical person walked on this earth and they're descended from him. Right? There's a difference between the two in terms of how they're looking. So Jesus is stripping this away. He's saying, you can't see my father. We know that. But you can see him through me. He speaks of invisible principalities, both good and bad, that govern and control our lives. Why? Because they're saying we're the, we're the sons of God. And he says, you're the sons of the devil. Who are we talking about? Are we talking about physical beings? No. no, we're talking about spirit beings. So Jesus is talking to them in a spiritual sense. Jesus says there is a spirit being, a fallen angel cast out from heaven called the devil, who hates people and works behind the scenes to, scenes to destroy, deceive, lie, and cause you to doubt and believe a lie. This is what happens to these men. They are deceived. They have believed so many little lies that appeal to their pride. They are no longer capable of understanding and recognizing the truth when Jesus speaks it. Jesus then asks his second question in verse 46. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Jesus stands before his enemies publicly, but again, there is no answer. So every time he asks them a question, they can't answer him. No one said, you cheated me. You stole from me. You lied to me. There's nothing they can pin on him. So they can't demolish his claim that he came from God. They have no proof, but they are judging him. This is why as Christians, we must either think Jesus is mad or he is who he says he is. He certainly put it all out there and leaves us no choice. The third question of Jesus is also in verse 46 when he says, I am telling, if I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Jesus has stripped away the veil that they are free men before God to reveal they are slaves to sin in desperate need of a redeemer. So he states plainly in verse 47, he who belongs to God, hears what God says. So we should take that to heart as well. Right? He who belongs to God, hears what God says. 
for us, if God has his written word and we believe what it says, we're hearing from God and we believe in God. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So as Jesus said to them earlier, the truth will set him free. So we go to the very last portion of the scripture for today from John 8 verses 48 to 59. And it's titled, The Claims of Jesus About Himself. So again, John 8, verses 48 to 59. Sorry, excuse me. Okay, so John 8, verses 48 to 59. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? So talking about going from one extreme to the other. I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honour my Father and you dishonour me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets that you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste the death are you greater than our father abraham he died and so did the prophets who do you think you are so again that same question jesus replied if i glorify myself my glory means nothing my father whom you claim is your god is the one who glorifies me though you do not know him i know him if i said i did not i would be a liar like you but i do know him and obey his word your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. Very truly, I tell you, take notice of this. Every time you read in your Bible, it says, very truly, I tell you, or verily, I tell you the truth, those sort of words. This is like Jesus saying, look, this is absolutely categorically it. Right? It's like, I'm not mucking around now. This is the truth very truly i tell you jesus said before abraham was born i am so it's one of his i am statements it's categorical at this they picked up stones to stone him but jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds okay so we've reached the conclusion of the remarkable words of jesus in his dialogue with the jesus with the jewish leaders in the temple courts here Jesus angers them as he makes claim after claim about himself. There can only be two choices, bend down and worship, or, as they do, bend down and pick up the stones. So in verse 47, Jesus tells these men, The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. This is a stinging rebuke to men who consider themselves experts on God. Their response is predictable. They say Jesus talks like a Samaritan because what he says is what Samaritans say to Jews. So here's the explanation for why they say he's demon-possessed and he's a Samaritan. They claim, the Samaritans claim that the Jews do not know God. So that's their common, that's what they hear from the Samaritans. So when Jesus says, you do not know God, they say, you're a Samaritan. That's the connection, right? On the other hand, the Jews say they make this claim because they are demon-possessed. So if Jesus talks this way, they conclude he must be a demon-possessed Samaritan. So the Samaritans say you do not know God. The Jews say you must be demon-possessed if you think that. And so they come back to Jesus and say, you're a Samaritan who is demon-possessed. So that's where the understanding comes from. Jesus rebuffs them and commits his reputation to his father, saying in verse 50, I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he will be the judge. There is no retaliation, no name calling, no getting angry, and no striking back. Jesus puts his response back into the hands of his father. Jesus makes an even greater claim in verse 51 when he says, Very truly I tell you, Whoever obeys my word will never see death. If you ever want to get an instruction for what to do in your life, there it is. Only to receive yet another rebuke from the men before him in verses 52 to 53, 
At this they exclaimed, now we know that you are demon possessed. Okay, so the Jews are staggered. They proclaim Jesus to be demon possessed and argue if Abraham and the prophets have died, then who does he think he is? So in verse 54, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father whom you claim is your God is the one who glorifies me. In essence, he is saying, why don't you ask God who I am? You proclaim to know who God is, ask him. But of course they can't. So when he says it is God who will glorify him, he is pointing to his resurrection because being glorified means what? What does it mean? People say today, when someone dies and they pass, they said they have gone to glory. What does that mean? So a spirit coming back. That's you. So it is? Resurrection. Resurrection. Thank you. Perfect. So basically, when you talk with this word, it means that you're going to heaven to enjoy eternal life. All right, so when someone goes to glory, that's what it means. And so when Jesus is talking about this, he says the same thing. So he is pointing to his resurrection because being glorified means going to heaven to enjoy eternal life. We can know this from John 12, verse 23. Again, we're coming to this a bit later, uh, but the, re the reference is pertinent. Because uh, Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So in other words, he's telling them he's about to leave and go to the Father. These men probably don't understand Jesus, does not fear them, because he does not fear death. They're always persecuting and threatening death, right? And he's like, bring it on. Except he says, hang on, I'm not done yet. This is not the time the Lord appointed. So you've got a bit more to do first. Okay. But he's never running from it. In fact, what do you think is going on with all of this story that we're recounting from John? He's basically saying that Jesus keeps going to the temple and prodding these guys and saying, look, I'm he. You know, he's saying you're this and you're that. You know, you're hypocrites, you're liars. The devil's your father. I'm the son of God. Right. So he's pressing their buttons. He's revealing who he is. But there's a purpose for it because he's not going to get hung on that cross unless he pushes their buttons. Right? And so there is a timing in this and there is a method in this. So Jesus makes two claims in verse 55 to 56. He says, Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do not know but I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. What a stunning statement. Jesus reveals that he is intimate with God. He was there in the beginning and Abraham approved and rejoiced in him some 2,000 years earlier because he understood what Jesus came to do. So you can imagine the impact on these guys. Their forefather, their very claim to their faith, approved and bore witness to Jesus. So it makes you wonder, what scriptures are these guys reading? And this is the whole point. Jesus keeps telling you over and over and over, read the word, read the word. So let's review the last and most stunning claim of all in verse 57 to 59. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up the stones to stone him, but Jesus hid and slipped away from the temple grounds. This is one of the most remarkable statements of all scripture. Never let anybody tell you Jesus never claimed to be God. Right? This is one of the problems that we even have today, isn't it? Jesus categorically claims that he is God in this statement. He calls himself, why? He calls himself, I am. And I am was a reference to when Moses was called to lead his people from Egypt, he actually asked God a question. And the question he asked him, he said, Whom shall I say has sent me? You'll find it in Exodus 3, verse 14. Whom shall I say has sent me? And God replies, 
I am who I am. It is the same name that Jesus declares right now. So in conclusion today, I want you to think about what it means to have Jesus reign in your heart. Is he, and the English amongst you here, which is I think all of you today, funnily enough, <laughs> is he like the British monarchy reigning only as a figurehead or is he truly your Lord and Master who rules over every aspect of your life? Do you allow him to rule over your business, your career, your family, your relationships, your health and your finances? If you can't say yes to all of these, then you haven't fully accepted Jesus as the Lord over all of your life. In other words, you can't put something in a box over here like that doesn't count. Right? That's work, so we just, well, that's my family or whatever it is. You can't do it. It has to be all in. Okay? All right. Let's uh, bow our heads and we'll just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for such a powerful word today, Lord. We just uh, are very blessed um, to have John record this in his gospel so that we could actually be intimate with the very words of Jesus and what he was teaching to those who opposed him, Lord. Lord, we thank you because you sent Jesus to reveal himself so that we could know that he is the Messiah. And as he has done this, Lord, you have set each of us free. We thank you because Jesus makes it clear to us what we need to do in order to have an identity uh, that provides us with the ability to have complete freedom in our life, Lord. So we thank you for this. It is a great blessing to us. And I just pray today that this teaching uh, has blessed many people, Lord, that it has opened their eyes and opened their hearts and that they can, as we say, uh, place themselves parallel to the teaching and see in their own lives what you want to say to them as you speak into their hearts about what they may need to do, Lord. So again, we thank you. We ask you to bless this word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.